Pro wrestling in the year 2000 was riding a wave of popularity all around the world, and this was a no small thanks to the style getting stiffer and wrestlers being willing to push the limits on the amount of punishment that they were willing to take. Some would say the wrestlers in Japan took this to another level. Guys like Misawa, Kawada, Kobashi, Dr. Death, and many others were pushing the human bodies to limits as far as how much punishment they could withstand on a regular basis. What many do not realize is that at the exact same time, the female side of Japanese pro wrestling were selling out arenas on their own and were pushing those very same limits. Women like Bull Nakano, Akira Hokuto, and Manami Toyota were putting on matches that rivaled the matches of the men a quarter of a century before WWE's alleged women's revolution. Contrary to popular belief, women didn't all of a sudden become capable of learning more moves than a hair mare starting in 2010. One may ask themselves, why isn't this discussed more often? Or maybe even a documentary of some sort made on this topic. Surprisingly enough, there was. While most things in wrestling do also get held close to the vest, there is no shortage of documentaries and stories that cover everything from the triumphs of a wrestling promotion to a wrestler falling out with a promoter. From Wrestling With Shadows to The British Wrestler, about Grado's story in pro wrestling, there has been no shortage of wrestling being covered outside of the simple week-to-week -week shows put on. One of the more popular ones from WWE was Tough Enough, which became well known for producing talent for WWE regularly, but also for a specific incident that many still hold against those in charge today. During the show, Bob Holly took liberties with student Matt Capitelli and gave him a black eye. In the years since, Bob Holly has been a poster child in many circles as a bully and among the worst wrestling trainers. This isn't an attempt to excuse anything that Bob or anyone else has done, but what would you say if you found out that at the same time across the world there was something being put to film that would make Bob Holly seem like nothing by comparison? Let us set the stage. The 2000 documentary from the BBC called Gia Girls is a look behind the training and road to debut for the Gia Joshi promotion. The documentary follows three subjects. Chigusa Nagio, the top star and booker for Gia. <laughs> Meiko Satomura, a rising star in the promotion. And Saika Takeuchi, a young girl training to become a professional wrestler. Most documentaries would have a narration of sorts going to explain the footage you see. This one does not. It is presented without narration or opinion. There is something about this that makes the situations come off more raw, as the usual spectacle of dramatic music and camera cuts are absent here, and left in its place are lingering shots and shaky handheld camera work. In place of the standard of what documentaries are today, this one maintains a dedication to showing the situations in as real of a light as possible. This approach to filmmaking is one of the reasons we're talking about this today, as it didn't shy away from showing some very uncomfortable realities of what was going on in the Joshi scene at the time. Jigusa Nagio was a very popular wrestler through the 80s in the Crush Gals team with Lioness Asuka. Although Lioness Asuka would go on to be a bigger name, Nagio would found her own promotion called Gia. As is the trend with a booker who is wrestling on the card, it didn't take long for her to become the top star of the promotion, and Gia were doing shows in the same venues All Japan and New Japan frequent to this day. Gia Girls and Jigusa Nagayo, in the beginning at least, seemed a success. Maiko Satomura was a wrestler at the time for the promotion and was one of the better wrestlers even back at this time. Satomura is a bodybuilder and international wrestling star who had even appeared in WCW on Monday Night Nitro at this point. Just athlete in professional sports. Miko Satomura, thank you. Her story is very quickly revealed to be one of a rising star who questions if they will ever make it to the top of the promotion. And finally, there is Saika Takeuchi. She's a young girl wanting to become a professional wrestler and for more reasons than simply being a fan or loving the sport. Saika is clear in that she wants to be someone. Wants to be someone that people will notice instead of feeling like a nobody. 
Over the course of the documentary, you are shown that Saika is very much in need of debuting to be a wrestler. And that is something much bigger than just being a wrestler for her. She feels that if she could become a wrestler, it will give her a much greater meaning than simply being able to wrestle on TV. For lack of a better way to say it, it seems it is her avenue to seek validation for her existence and who she is. There are many dangers associated with that way of thinking, and unfortunately for Saika, she crosses paths with many of them. The story begins by showing the facility, which happens to be a warehouse and a field and some of the trainees working out. We are then shown a clip of Nagayo saying that she views the trainees as her children because she doesn't have any children of her own. After that, we are given a look at Saika training. It cuts over to Saika talking about her expectations of being a wrestler and why she has chosen to start training to be a wrestler. Dreams. Don't you want a world of unconditional love and brotherhood? We have the secrets to self-improvement. You can join us and be special. I am not a person who is 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 not a person the documentary then goes into showing the differences in the lives of Nagayo and her trainees. Nagayo is out getting her hair done and doing radio interviews hyping up her events, while the trainees are left to their living quarters, which appears to be about the size of a jail cell with bunk beds lining the walls. Control their behavior. Come live with us. Wear these clothes. Eat this food. All you need is two hours sleep. We see Sugiyama Yuka, president of GIA Japan, introduce a girl who had quit training before and came back for another shot, and an interesting phrase is said to the recruit by trainer Chigusa Nagayo. <laughs> The documentary continues to follow Chigusa on her media tour leading up to her bout with former crush girl tag team partner Linus Asuka and shows the bout. While this is taking place, it is really hard to not notice how huge of a deal Gia and Joshi Wrestling were at the time. Streamers from all directions and people cheering every step of the way, the film cuts back to the barracks and the girls are training. It follows the trainee who had left and come back for a while, showing that she is still struggling. During this time, Meiko Satomura can be seen coaching her and at one point even helping her complete an exercise. During all of this, Saika is seen off to herself training and doing her best. After the documentary begins to show a few light-hearted moments, it takes us to the next day's training and where the nature of things become much clearer. Satomura is sparring with Saika and going pretty rough on her and being pretty stiff with her. There must be something wrong with you. There must be something wrong with you. At a point, Saika is giving Satomura drop kicks, and Satomura reprimands her for throwing bad drop kicks before giving her a drop kick in the face as hard as she could. And I believe this might go without saying, but in pro wrestling, drop kicks are thrown at the chest and are never intended to bust someone's face open to such a degree.
There must be something wrong with you. There must be something wrong with me. After doing this, Sotomayor proceeds to give a why did you make me do this to you speech in the form of chastising the girl for not being professional. She then makes sure to tell the girl that she's lucky that it was Maiko doing it and not someone else before dismissing Saika for the day and telling her to go rinse her mouth. Here. The enemy will electroshock you, torture you, kill you, or carry you off to hell. The next day begins with a talk with Nageo, where she is explaining to Saika that what happened to her was her fault the day before for not doing a drop kick right, and she has to try harder or she will get injured. <laughs> There must be something wrong with me. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Nagio then turns to the other trainees, not the trainers, and explains that they are responsible to make sure that Saika makes her debut successfully. There is a short clip then shown of Satomura explaining that she had to do what she did to Saika or she wouldn't be a real wrestler and only be one in name. The takeaway being that Saika needed to be tougher on herself and more disciplined. It is also to think Maiko was being unfair to her after helping someone else in their exercises along just one day before. A segment of people would say the idea of being driven home here is that no wrong can be done by the ones in charge, and the same people who are not in charge of when they are even allowed to go to the bathroom are the ones to blame for anything that happens. Thus, keeping those in charge of everything from having to face any of their errors being their own fault, at least in their own circles. You may find this type of mentality or behavior familiar if you happen to be a fan of movies like The Wicker Man or or maybe ever heard of a fellow named Jim Jones? Now it may seem heavy handed, but indulge the thought experiment for a moment. A small group of people cut off from the outside world, all subservient to a central figure whom you're told have all the answers and no matter how badly you're treated, you're assured it is your fault. And then they psychologically batter those who express wanting to leave. I think we have a name for things like that. Nagayo used her status over Saika and the other trainees to emotionally manipulate them into feeling like disobedient children who are disappointing her rather than adults she's training to be wrestlers. Many times in the documentary, Nagayo is seen saying how she's hurt more than the students when they're attacked at her school. There are a million alarm bells going off and 
red flags flying everywhere anytime Nagio opens her mouth and it all contributes to a very questionable and worrisome environment that our girl Saika and the other trainees have found themselves in here. We are shown footage of Satomura vs Kato where Satomura is booked to lose and the documentary follows Satomura where she can be seen crying behind the building a day later because she questions if she should have been booked to lose and whether she will make it to a top status in the company. Not long ago, she was going at Saika for having her face busted, but not long after she's crying behind the building for being booked to lose a wrestling match? Do with that information what you will. Fast forward a bit and we see Saika is training and told by Nagayo that she has a lot of expectations on her and tells her to get a haircut. There's another theme of constantly telling Saika there's something wrong with how she looks in the documentary, and you can tell it drives an already introverted person further. There must be something wrong with me. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. At this point, the girl who has come back for a second try ends up leaving again by sneaking out in the middle of the night after having watched Saika's treatment. I think I want to leave. You must be insane. You are not living up to your potential. You are not living up to your potential. You cheated on that test. Eventually, one of the matches catches the ire of Nagayo. She didn't feel Sayaka fought back enough. <laughs> Nagayo then pulls her aside in a weird exercise of milking tears begins to tell Sayaka that she is useless and to go home because she stands no chance and will get injured. As soon as Sayaka begins to compose herself, 
Nagayo begins smacking her and telling her that her tears are fake. Saika is then held by Nagayo in front of the other trainees as if to show them how proud she was for making the tiniest person in the world cry before telling Saika that she was done while walking out of the building. A distraught Sayaka, only a few steps behind her, begged her to please let her try out to be a wrestler. After seeing this, a girl straight up walks to the table and tells the president she's done and doesn't even want to be a wrestler anymore after seeing how Sayaka was treated. Later in the night, the girl is brought to speak with Nageo, who gives her a talk about how the trainee should consider how much they are hurting her and how much pain she's in when one of the students leaves. <laughs> She refuses to shake the girl's hand, tells her she hates her, and then tells her to leave. A short time later, a new girl is brought into the camp by her mom, who is already worried about pro wrestling from the start. Don't you want devoted followers who leave their families for you, give their money to you, give their bodies to you, give up their lives for you? Start with a prolonged period of love bombing. Surround them with unconditional love and attention. But was likely more worried when she got a call around two days later following Saika's test. Saika has been granted the ability to stay in the camp and was told she was going to receive her test to see if she could debut for the Gia Girls promotion. Saika showed up and was going as hard as she could in her test as would be expected, and was still receiving stiff shots from all those she tested against. Saika continued on with her test until the final stage. She had to get in the ring with Nagayo. Nagayo did exactly what you would expect. She didn't work with Saika and proceeded to hit her with shoot holds and strikes after an especially real lariat where Saika may have been knocked loopy or at the very least legit rocked. Saika is unable to get Nagayo's body weight off of her and Nagayo considers this giving up. into a crying and bloody Saika about being a quitter and making sure to milk every single tear she can out of her with a few more smacks before finally telling her they are going to make a decision. <laughs>
After everything that had happened, the day finally came and in front of her family, friends, and the world, Taiga was finally allowed to debut against Maiko Satomura. And even though she lost the bout, she was finally a pro wrestler and finally a someone. No matter how you feel about other things, the fact that she made it to the debut match is a nice thing to know. All of the unpleasantry and manipulative behavior it took to get there is what makes many shy away from Saika's story of making it to her debut. She didn't all of a sudden become a superstar the moment she put on her wrestling gear or transform into a new person. But she was a somebody now. A quick side note, watching her mom react to the match while it's happening is one of the highlights of the film. By the end of things, her family was proud of her, her friends were proud, and I like to think she was proud of her. Where the ending begins to get less pleasant is the way things played out after the credits rolled. Saika Takeuchi wrestled for two more years and it was rare she saw W. By the end of her run, she began teaming fairly successfully with Maiko Satomura. The wrestling was not to be a part of her life for very long though, and she retired to a quiet life now, voluntarily giving up the life of the pro wrestling, and once again resigning to becoming just another face in the crowd. Hopefully finding her peace and place in somewhere there. Nagayo would see Gia girls dwindle down to, at one point, only having six native wrestlers before the company would fold after the 2005 show where she would lose to her protege Meiko Satomura in the main event of the company's final card. Nagayo still shows up from time to time in events, but has been retired from the ring formerly since 2005. She's still held in high regard, but most of the Japanese pro wrestling scene and this situation didn't play much of a factor in the downfall of Gia Girls. Nagayo has made brief comebacks since retirement and people seem to be glad to see her every time she laces them up. Then there's Meiko Satomura. At the conclusion of Gia, Satomura was able to say she had achieved her goal and was at the top of the promotion when they closed their doors. She had a very healthy run-in in almost every wrestling promotion you can think of, from Sendai Girls to Jakara to even the WWE. Which is where this takes a curious turn of thought. Maiko Satomura was brought in to teach, coach, and wrestle. WWE hired her to do the exact same job she has in the Gia Girls film. Maiko Satomura, as of posting this video, is a coach and trainer as well as champion of NXT UK. Now, I'm not one for cancel culture, and the idea of bringing this up is not to get anyone canceled, but if we hate Bob Holly 20 years later for giving some guy a black eye and it's been touted as the biggest breach of trust for a trainer to do to a student, and those who do such things have no place in the business. What am I supposed to think when that company hires Maiko Satomura for the same job? If you're new here, be sure to hit subscribe. If you liked the video, please make sure to leave a like and a comment below and tell us your thoughts. If you wanted to help out the channel as well, we also have memberships available. And you can check out our Twitch links in the description box below as well as join our Discord. That's all we have for you today. We'll see you in the next one.